Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome to the second day of the conference. Uh, glad to have you back. Yes. Some of you, yeah. <laughs> I do see some familiar faces from, from yesterday. Um, we hope we can continue the discussions and talk further about how to attract and reach an audience with documentaries. Um, the first speaker of the day is Maya Lindquist from Dog Lounge in Sweden, uh, a 10 year old initiative. Uh, and she will talk about the organization, how they work with documentary screenings and creating events around them. So, welcome, Maya. Great to have you here. Okay. Hey, nice to see you all, uh, brave people for Sunday morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in St. Petersburg. It's very exciting and also at this festival. Um, so thank you for inviting me uh, and thank you for coming to listen. It was very interesting to be here uh, yesterday and to hear all the speak speakers and the discussions. And I hope this day will also be interesting. Uh, they can continue the, the talk from yesterday. Um, yes, I'm Maya Lindquist and I'm the managing director uh, of Doc Lounge. I'm also the program manager of a festival called Nordis Panorama that ended uh, three days ago. So if if you see if I seem a little bit tired and lost, that's because I'm tired and lost. Uh, so bear with me, but I'm doing my best. Um, Ten years ago, I was uh, 26, and uh, I just uh, finalized my studies and got a full-time job in Malmö. Uh, it was a total different uh, area than film, uh, but I felt I wanted to have something meaningful on my spare time, and I wanted to meet people. And I always liked film and culture, so I, I signed up to be a volunteer at the Art House Cinema in, in Malmö. But it was really boring. Uh, there was I, I sat there all by myself all evening. I was supposed to sell tickets, but there was no one to sell tickets to. And I didn't meet any people, so I'm kind of like, what am, I, what am I doing here? It felt meaningless. So I saw this note or flyer once. Um, entry screenings. Please come to this meeting. And I was like, oh, documentaries. <laughs> uh, that wasn't really my cup of tea. But I was new in town. I want to do new things. So I, th I thought I'd give it a try. And that kind of changed my life for good. Um, so, basically, 10 years ago, uh, as many of you talked about, like people, and, and also what I thought, documentaries uh, are boring, they are dry, heavy, maybe something you watch on television, maybe something, you know, older people go to cinema to see. Um, and that was the kind of common uh, view of documentaries in Sweden 10 years ago. Um, and there was this, uh, and a lot of people, of course, wanted to change this. And one person who wanted to change it was uh, the Swedish uh, filmmaker Fredrik Gerten. I don't know if you know know him, but he's been he's mostly known for his bananas films, uh, bananas. And then who is about uh, which is about the banana workers in Nicaragua. And then he got sued by the Dole Food Company, and he made another film called Big Boys Gun Bananas. And then he also did Bikes versus Cars and Becoming Slatan that we talked about yesterday. So he thought this is uh, like documentaries deserve something much better than being boring <laughs> and, uh, and uh, per or perceived as being boring. So he wanted to make documentaries cool and hip and to attract a new audience like the, the, the new generation of uh, people. Uh, so then he thought, like, how do you do that? Like, what does young people want to do? Do you know? Like, what do young people want to do in Russia? Do you have any ideas? No one? You don't know what young people want to do? Beer? Girls? Okay, good. <laughs> yes, so in Sweden, people want to have beers. People want to have girls as well, and guys, and uh, people want to listen to music. Young people go out to hang out with their friends. 
So he thought, okay, what can we learn from the music industry that we don't know? Like, why do they attract young people? Uh, and how can we attract young people? So he started a concept together with a musician and um, like a club queen, a club organizer in Malmö. Uh, they started together this concept called Doc Lounge, where they merge the music industry with the documentary industry and moved the documentary screenings out from cinemas, not because they didn't like cinemas, but because the art house cinema, at least in Malmö in Sweden at that time, was perceived as just for some people, not for everyone. It was kind of niche and, and intellectual, and a lot of people didn't feel welcome. So they, they moved it out to other kind of venues, which was more attractive to other people. And uh, it was an immediate success. Uh, this could have been me, but it's not me. Um, I was uh, very, I was blown away, blown away as many other people. Like I thought, documentary was boring, but it was actually not. And a lot of people uh, came to the evenings and was surprised by the same thing, and was actually coming for the the events and the nice atmospheres. So um, I'm going to talk more about the events and and how we created the the, the hype uh, around documentaries, um, because ten years later. Today, uh, we uh, operate in 19 cities around the, the Nordic countries, so Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Norway. Uh, we've been screening 530 films, or 550 films, sorry, and been doing 1,200 unique events during these 10 uh, years, reaching over 100,000 visitors. And what you can also say about the audience is that 80% is under 40, which we consider young, so between 20 and 40 is our main core audience, uh, which is very rare for documentaries in Sweden or in the Nordic countries. Um, so today, when we are like a full network of screening places, we uh, work as a, like exclusive launching platforms for new documentaries. We do screenings before they go up on cinemas to kind of get the bus going around the films, and uh, we work as a distribution channel for Nordic, but also international documentaries. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I thought, what I think is like the success factors around uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, screenings and what we've been doing to, to reach out uh, and actually build an audience because I think we talked a lot about yesterday that there is an audience out there and, and yes, I think there is, but I also think we have to create it. Um, because as many say, as many, uh, as we know, there is a lot of um, people who doesn't know that they actually like documentaries. So we have to make them come. There is uh, European uh, research to say, that says that uh, people who have seen a film, a documentary, they're more likely to see another documentary, which also point out that if you see a documentary, you kind of change your mind. Uh, and perceive it differently. So, first thing, the room. So we took it out from the cinema, and that's, as I said before, as I said before, it's not because it's we don't like cinemas, and of course, uh, the technical um, uh, screening and the sound is better in a cinema. But we wanted to create a very like casual, casual uh, uh, experience experience for people, so that you feel that you can come there with your friends. We open up one hour before the event, uh, before the screening, so people can come, have a drink, and just hang out with their friends. Uh, and we also reached another audience with with uh, moving it out to pe uh, venues where they actually hang out otherwise as well. So here is some kind of here is another. Another room, people hanging out, meeting friends. Um, the program, of course, is also very important. Uh, we program new films uh, and uh, high quality films that often have been yeah, winners from different festivals and so on. Um, and we always want to have like the city premiere. So we don't have to have like the national premiere or anything, but we want, to, we want to be the first one who screened the film in that city, 
which means it's also before television, before cinema, and before other festivals. And this is because we want to give the audience, of course, a very unique uh, experience, and uh, we want them to know that if you come to Docklands, you're always going to see something new, so you don't have to even look up what it is beforehand, you just come, which we have a lot of people doing. They just show up and it's like, what's on tonight? Uh, but also, we, we work a lot with, with outreach uh, and get the bus going around the film, so it would be very, like, it would be a waste of time if we would do all that work late in the film's life, so to say, so that people couldn't see the film afterwards. So, uh, all the people that we reach that can't make it to our first event, they can then go to the cinemas or the television or other, other events that shows the film. Um, so we work a lot with uh, new films, as I said, but also the diversity. Uh, we want to show the whole genre, the whole spectra of the genre. So we sc uh, screen both creative, uh, very experimental documentaries, more journalistic ones, uh, mainstream, uh, uh, like Michael Moore films or uh, uh, music documentaries, like the Janis Joplin film, for example. And that is to be uh, that is both to uh, sh uh, show the whole genre of uh, uh, the documentaries to the people, but also to attract different kind of audiences. Uh, because when they in when they come and they like the film, they will come hopefully for the next film, and that's what we see that people get interested in a film, a topic, and they come, and then they like the concept, so they come back next next uh, week as well. And just to give you uh, some examples. This is all the films that we screened this spring. It's uh, Kim Longinotto's Dreamcatcher. Uh, it's the Janis Joplin film. Uh, Wolfpack from uh, that uh, was in Sundance. Sunita, maybe some titles that you know of. And this, this uh, spring, or this autumn, we show uh, the Wiener the political documentary that opened at Sundance, uh, Strike a Pose. Uh, we have the longest run that we talked about yesterday, about the uh, immigrant conflict in, uh, in Greece. And Bugs, of course, the Danish documentary about eating insects and uh, if that is the future for uh, humanity or not. And what you see here, Docklands official selection, is a selection of films that we do every season or twice a year. We choose around 10 films that we work with collect collectively. So we buy rights for all the network. Uh, and, and the local partners can choose from this selection. And they can also program their own films because we want to have a, a good balance of joint program and local program. I think the local programming is very important to reach out to the local audiences. So if you have a local premiere, for example, or a local collaboration with a film festival, that is a way of uh, bringing local people to, to the screenings, I think. Uh, so, the event, why do we do that? Um, it's not because we don't believe that the documentary is good enough. Uh, it is, of course, uh, good enough. But uh, the event around it brings in new, new kind of people and new audiences. So we don't separate the event and the production of the screening and then outreach. It's the same thing. So when we plan the event, we actually see that as an outreach. Who can we invite? What can we do at the screening that will bring audiences to the event? Uh, can we invite a local band, for example, who will then bring their friends and their family? Uh, can we invite a, a well-known artist, like here, for example, Nina Persson from Cardigans. I don't know if you know her, but uh, she came and she presented a couple of songs which make uh, f the film and the event a cool thing for people to go to. Uh, it could also be local experts, of course, local organizations that come and present their work. Dance, performances, everything that is kind of a... Uh, creates an atmosphere and, and creates an added value for the people who are there, but also bring in new people. That's the whole idea. So here is another event uh, that was made in Varbe when they screened Bikes versus Cars. And just some pictures of uh, music, live music, and Ai Weiwei on big screen after the film asking, answering questions from the audience. 
Another thing I think is also very important is collaborations. I think we have to collaborate a lot in this field and in this work to reach and create new audiences. Uh, and it's collaborations, of course, with the directors and producers. Uh, some directors and producers are very hardworking also when it comes to outreach and creating an audience, like we heard yesterday when Stina talked. And it would be very stupid to not <laughs> collaborate with them when we are screening the films. Um, but also to collaborate with local, uh, not only non-profit organizations, which can reach out to their members and so on, but also local entrepreneurs and uh, local politicians, uh, for example, to actually reach out f uh, further than your own network. Because I think trust is very important when you invite to an event, and a lot of our audiences trust us, but there's also a lot of people who doesn't tr like trust us because they don't know us yet but they trust maybe their member organization that they uh, uh, are engaged in. So if you can find other, other people who can invite people for you, so to say, uh, that has been very successful for us. And also collaborate with big film festival in the city and other kind of events, libraries and so on. And then, of course, some surprises and champagne always helps, uh, at least in Sweden. I don't know here in Russia, but I've heard you like drinking beer here as well. So that's uh, a big, big uh, success factor at Docklands, that you can actually have a drink uh, while watching the film. Um, we have also worked a lot with the brand that's sometimes in documentary uh, the documentary industry, that's, people think that that's not really a good thing to do, you shouldn't brand yourself, it's too commercial, but it has helped us a lot uh, <clears throat> to kind of really focus on the brand and the concept. Uh, we can have a really broad program but still be very uh, specific in that sense, um, because we can build trust. So we are very, um, with all our 19 cities that we're working with, we have a very um, strict concept, so to say. They have to follow certain rules, and we are very we follow up on their quality all the time. And that's because we want to build trust so that people come even though they don't know the film. Because that's the reality. We don't have big, big marketing money to, to market all the documentaries that we screen. Uh, but we, 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 we market the brand, and then people trust us. Uh, yeah, the concept. And always being innovating and, inclusion, and including people, so people who feel welcome uh, in the events and a part of a movement, so to say, and of course quality. Okay. And continuity, I think, is also a very important uh, uh, part of, the, of, of our work. We, we are not like a pop-up cinema, we don't do things now and then and then we disappear. We have been doing in Malmö screenings every, first it was Mondays, but now it's Tuesday, every Tuesday, uh, every week since 10 years. Uh, and it's every time the same time, and it's kind of the same concept, even though we fill the evenings with different things. Um, so people get it into their systems and into their agendas, and it's like, oh, it's Tuesday, let's go to Doc Cloud. And it really works. And then I also think it's very important to think big. Um, it's easy and quite often people think, oh, let's start small and then we can see if there is an interest, we can grow. I meet that a lot. But that's actually not going to happen. If you start small, you're going to stay small. That's my experience at least. Um, and when I started, like six years ago, I started up the, 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 um, the screenings in another city called Lund, which is very close to Malmö, and everyone's told me, oh, you can't do it, it's too close to Malmö, you, will, you won't find an audience, or you can't do it every week, you have to do it sec like every second week or once a month, it's too much. Oh, you can't do it in a, in a venue that takes 300 people, you're crazy. But you can, and if you want to do it, it's, it's possible. And, and if you want to be big, you have to think big. That's, I think that's uh, uh, a, a very important thing to, to bring with you and be ambitious. Ambitious about the experience for the audience, the numbers of the audience, and uh, we always, like when we started, we said we always want to have full house. That's a doc lounge. That's how you know it's a doc lounge. And it's also about storytelling. So when people start to say, 
oh, it was a full house, I couldn't get in, then it suddenly turned into something important for people and, and, uh, and valuable for people. So when I came to the season opening last year, uh, this is outside the, the screening venue in Malmö, and I saw the police there, I first got very, very nervous. But then my colleagues say, said that the police was just there, they thought they would like, they were wondering what it was happening there because there was such a long queue and they didn't have the information about this event and people started to be quite uh, anxious in the queue because they couldn't get into the, the film screening. And we said, oh, it's just a documentary club. And they're like, yeah, right. And they went in and came out and they were very, very surprised. So when the police uh, shows up, we are very happy because then we have succeeded. So, the Doc Lunch Network. Um, we have the head office in Malmö still. Uh, in Malmö we do screenings every week, as we have been doing for a long time. But we also develop new concepts and uh, work with the distribution uh, strategies through, throughout the, ne the network. And if you are a part of the network, uh, you get, of course, the, the contacts and networking. You get the high quality films that we are uh, providing them. Um, the proven concept, we have a joint website, a graphic profile, uh, marketing materials, but I think the most important is the support and the professional development that we can give them. Because most often there is the people who are uh, project managers locally are young, maybe sometimes students, they haven't uh, been doing film screenings before, um, and maybe sometimes they are musicians, they come from totally different uh, areas. So we can give them a lot of support in both how to do an event, how to do outreach, how to do marketing, um, but also uh, more insight into the documentary industry, understanding how it works with rights and so on. So we meet, I mean, we have a, a weekly contact or monthly contact with all the local partners uh, to help them with their aims and visions. Um, but also we meet up all together once or twice a year to do trainings and workshops and uh, so on. And uh, this year we're going to go to ITFA, all of us, to kind of see how a big festival works and, and, and get inspired. And so we are now 19 cities, maybe I told you before, but we also have three, four cities uh, coming up uh, in northern Sweden and also in uh, Norway this autumn. Um, but there is, I mean, since we put so much effort into all the cities because we want to have the quality brand still, it's kind of uh, time consuming, of course, for the head office and we can't grow as fast as we want to grow. Uh, and also it's kind of uh, both uh, time consuming and it takes a lot of resources in, in the local cities to be able to uh, start up and actually maintain uh, the, the organization there with screenings every week or every month. So we have now started to look into a new, uh, a new thing, a new concept, which we call Doc Lounge Live. And it's in a way a Doc Lounge, Doc Lounge Light. <laughs> so that we do um, a production of the Doc Lounge event that we do in Malmö uh, and we live stream it. We have several cameras and we live stream it out to libraries and cultural centers all around uh, Sweden. But also cinemas can join into this. So we distribute the film and then we distribute this live stream. So it's an easy way for uh, uh, organizers that are not so uh, used to doing cin cinema screenings to kind of just jump onto this and they get a film and they get the talk and the music and everything around it. Uh, so this is a new concept that we are working with uh, to launch in Sweden to be able to do more, uh, more events and more screenings and be bigger as a distribution platform. People could also, here you see a picture from one of the uh, events, so people could also interact with the, with the audience in Malmö by sending text or SMS. Uh, and it shows up on the screen, so it could be a discussion between different cities. Um, so this is a way of kind of having one event that is quite expensive, but being a lot of different organizers that could uh, pay for it, basically. So it's a new finance model also for us. 
we will see if it works. It's still very uh, in the beginning. But we heard someone say, oh, it feels like I'm on a Eurovision Song Contest. So that's, that was kind of a good, good comment, I think. Yeah, that was distribution. We also do uh, film screenings at conferences at, and at companies. We are working with documentaries as a tool for inspiration or development. There's a lot of uh, companies who want to discuss a certain topic with their employees, for example. And instead of bringing in an expert talking about something, we think that documentaries could give a really good insight and depth uh, on a topic and a good, be a good starting point for discussion and uh, development. So that's like a service we do. Um, and also uh, show films at conferences and so on. At the moment, we also do fundraise for a prison tour that we are developing together with one director and producer in, Malmö, uh, in Sweden. Uh, so we work together with the national prison organization. Uh, and it's a film about a woman who uh, has been taking drugs all her life, basically. And uh, then so, and, and finally, she, she, uh, she's also in jail. And it's, she has a very similar story than to very many uh, women who's in prison. So we're going to show the film and have discussion and debates around the five different uh, women prisons in Sweden. Uh, trends. <laughs> yeah, I think I, we've been talking about this quite a lot. Like, what is the what is the trends and what 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 is the future giving us? And we don't know. Uh, but I think there is two different two trends that is uh, working at the same time, and it's of course the when, where, and what I want. Uh, we want to see films when we are at home. We want to choose when we want to see the films and and how we want to see the films. Uh, and I think that's getting stronger and stronger. And I think the VOD platforms is going to be really, really important. However, I also think that the VOD platforms needs to be curated somehow because there's so many so much content out there and it's really hard to find and uh, it's easy to get lost. And on the other hand, we're still human beings and we still want to interact with other people. We still want to have uh, moments in life that we remember and, uh, and feel that this is a unique moment I can't miss. Uh, so I think that we have to go online, but I also think that the events and the, the great screenings where the directors are present or other things ha are happening are also getting more and more important um, to give people that kind of uh, presence in life. Um, challenges, uh, of course, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, it's expensive, it's hard to find money. Uh, we're trying to find new ways to, to find money. I think, as Dina said yesterday, there are a lot. There is a lot of money out, out there. We just need to find the ways how to do that. Um, other, other challenges for us is also, of course, the, the territories and the rights. We are operating in four countries. We would like to open up and collaborate with even more countries, but, it's, but the territories and the rights of the films is kind of putting uh, limits to that. It's, it's making it very, very complicated. Um, and also, of course, like the landscape is always changing uh, from television and cinema and VOD and, and where do we fit in into this and where can we uh, um, give the most to the audience and to the filmmakers and producers. So I think we could maybe discuss that a little bit more. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here and to present this that we've been doing and I would be, it would be very nice to hear your comments and if you have something similar in Russia, for example, or if you have ideas or questions. And if you want to see our webpage, it's doclaunch.se and you can reach me also at maya at doclaunch.se. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Maya, for this uh, great talk. Um, it's, can, I was just, uh, first of all, maybe you could tell a bit more about uh, the funding model. I believe you, you rely on, on public funds. Like, 
I guess that's how important for you, but do you also work with, with sponsors or just a bit more about how, how you're funded? Yeah, we rely on, uh, on public funding. So every local uh, unity is locally funded by the municipality, for example, or other kind of funds that, that, that exist for culture in Sweden. Uh, but also, of course, entrances. We, I mean, I think a third at least of the local money comes from ticket sales to, to the audience, from the audience. Um, and then nationally, we are working only at the moment with, uh, with local, regional, Nordic and uh, international funding um, to, to survive. But that's why we also s try to kind of uh, uh, develop these new concepts of, for example, Doc Lounge Live, that we hope can bring in more ticket sales also to the head office in Malmö. But we don't have any sponsors at the moment. We would love to have sponsors, but it's, Sweden is not that big in sponsorships in culture. It's uh, very in the beginning, and, and uh, they normally want to sponsor big, big events rather than things that happens every week somewhere. Uh, so that's, that's been our challenge at the moment, yeah. And how about the, the transfer from, from Sweden to, to the other countries? Also, when you mentioned that you're going to do these dog live sessions, is that only then in Sweden, or are you also going to have some more, like if it's in Swedish language, are you going to transfer that to dog lounges in the other Nordic countries? Uh, we don't know yet. We have started in Sweden because we are bigger, biggest in Sweden. We're also based in Sweden, so we know that market better. Um, so we will start in Sweden and see how it goes, if it's successful. <clears throat> I think we will also uh, give it a try in, in other countries. And then, I mean, then we will have it in English, of course, and, and uh, transfer it to Finland, Denmark and Norway. Um, I was thinking, uh, you were talking yesterday about the film clubs. Is there anything here that could be of, of inspiration to the work you do? So of course, inspiration, yes, we got inspiration. I just don't know, in, I just don't know how it can be applied in Russia. During all the conference, I've been thinking how I can change, how we can make a breakthrough in our work. Maybe when the conference is over, um, I will understand more whether we're ready or not. Yeah, of course. I mean, a lot of this costs a lot of money, and I understand that that's always hard to get, also for us. But there is also some examples of some local clubs here in, in our network, in Kalma, for example, who doesn't get any uh, local support. They do it voluntarily, and they have, or maybe they have a little bit of money to kind of uh, pay the, the, the screening fees and buy some candles and stuff like that. But it's very, very small budget, and they really succeeded to, to build a big, big audience uh, also in their town. Uh, because they've been, of course, they, they come to our trainings and so on, but they also see how much it is about, uh, not really about money, of course it's about time, but it's about how you talk about uh, documentaries and how you show your passion and how you create events and how you invite people that is, because when we invite uh, famous people for our event, we don't pay them. It's more of, please come and show your support and they come, maybe they sing a song or they play some records. But it's all about building the brand. Uh, and that takes time, of course, but it doesn't have to cost money. Are there other comments in the room? Yeah? Hey, Maya, thanks uh, for this beautiful presentation. I just wanted to ask you, do you, how much do you need to compromise with the program of the films that you pick because of course I mean you know your audience and you know that you really need to bring out something from the scratch and you need to build out the audience so how how does the discussion about films work with your team and what are the challenges in this? Uh, I wouldn't say I compromise at all when I do the, 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 the films uh, of course I think about the program and I really want to have a broad program so I like all the films that I program, uh, even though some of them are really mainstream and some of them are really niche. 
but that's maybe also how I am. I really like the whole genre of documentaries, and uh, and for me, it's more about like how can I actually uh, attract new people and, and 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 show them that documentaries could be fun, that could be exciting, it could be thrilling. Um, so. Of course, you could say sometimes like, oh, that wasn't the most artistic documentary in the world. And sometimes you can say, why didn't you show this uh, super exciting, very niche film? But yeah, we choose, as everyone chooses their program. And I think uh, for me, it's not a problem. I always uh, see quality in the films that we screen. But of course, it's a challenge all the time because sometimes you put in a like a South Korean film that you really love and you know everyone would love if they see it. <laughs> but like, how do you reach out to the the audience? And I had this South Korean film once, and and I was just struggling and struggling. Like I, I could see that no one would would come. And uh, then in the last minute, I found those two South Korean students in my town who were really cool and hip, and they just like, oh, we love this film, it's been like uh, on, on cinema in South Korea, and they just, they came and they played record, and suddenly like they brought all the South uh, Korean community uh, in town, and there was, I mean, it was not a huge audience, but still we had like 100 people coming to see this totally unknown uh, film. So you can always find like people and ways to, to bring in people, if you really love the film yourself. And you say that you screen a film every week, every Tuesday. So every week you start a new campaign, so to say. Like you have to make an individual campaign for for all films. Like how do you work with both this individual targeting for a specific film and and the Duck Lounge core audience, so to say? Yeah, of course it's a mix of that. We can't work like Stina told us yesterday, we can't work three years with one film. It's it's not possible. But of course we work longer than one week. We start earlier uh, and we work uh, up, up until the, the film's place. But we wouldn't be able to have an audience if we wouldn't market the brand, Doc Clouch, as well. Um, so it's very important for us to, to have the people coming and coming and coming again. So. We get new audiences every week, but then they stay for the next week because they like the concept, even though the film is about suicide bomber in Syria one time, and next time it's about architecture and something like that. So it's, uh, but of course, it's a, it's a big part of us as well to reach out to new audiences through the film's topic every time. Are there any other comments, questions from the room? I was thinking yesterday, I think it was you who were mentioning uh, screenings in a nightclub. Isn't, isn't this perfect? Uh, beers, clubs, it must be the perfect venue for documentaries. Yes, of course, I was telling about that experiment and yesterday I was saying that financially it was a fiasco. I mean, it didn't get any support from the audience either, but it's a cool story. I was late a little bit for your report, I'm very sorry, but but I heard what you were saying. It is your events, the symbiosis of music and cinematography. As a performance, as an event, it's brilliant. I don't remember, somebody was mentioning the concept yesterday that very often we looked at the other industries for help for example music industry or any other kind of industry I think and it's my personal opinion we are fighting for people's eyes for the viewer for the audience and cinematography as an audiovisual art is fighting for the eyes and it's fighting the theater, fighting the circus. So we want to get the audience, the eyes, and then later on we're fighting for the conscience of the viewers. So the history of screenings in the nightclubs comes down to the fact that besides the event itself, the film screening, there's also a preparation part. So I'm saying like warming up, when you're inviting famous people, famous speakers, 
if it's a very art house project then you have poets for example or somebody else but people who want to express themselves and if you really make it in a right way you really warm up the interest to your screening to the picture that you're showing and that's going to help open that film for the audience and it's my personal opinion when you have a feature film I mean don't talk about it too much in advance because film tells about everything and then uh, that's enough but if you screen a documentary film an art house film you really better do the warm up and discussion and now it's a great experience you guys are very right and when we talk about the musical accompaniment about the musical industry that you're using for the film industry if you do it in the right way for example if you invite some nice instrumental quartet and you create the mood that you need for the screening that is fantastic move great and it would bring the audience to the right emotional acceptance of the film but about the experiment itself and about the experience itself you have to be um, have to be prepared you have to know what you're doing because if you just do it without preparation you lose the chemistry and then there is no connection with the audience and that's a very important thing to have a connection so if you decide to work that way do that but please don't think that everything comes down to money I think that everything comes down to people the musicians are people the people who do the screen are real people and so it's only people who matter in the end and it's people who do the marketing strategy so if you talk about the small towns then it's really not a marketing but letting know about the event I should say but it's people who form the audience so of course some fans of the dance music they go for a rave for a drive to the nightclubs of course you can't really invite them to watch the documentary films I mean it would be nice if those fans come to watch your film but the important thing should be the audience that want to see and that will see what you're showing what you're screening and of course you can have people who just come drop by and like the film but you have to plan everything in advance you have to think in advance that's the most important thing that's all I want to say yes I agree as well and it's uh, it is it's very it's very important and the people is the most important and that's how we work also with always having a host for the evening that works through like the whole season or the whole year uh, greeting people talking to people being like the the person who's actually like inviting you to your home, basically. And you also, oh, sorry. I just wanted to say that I worked in Kazakhstan for some time. I just wanted to say that for some time I was working in Kazakhstan with the documentary films, and I met a person that was working with a projector and with a bunch of performance. They make a tour in small towns and they make small concerts and these concerts bring people to the concert and then they do a screening, the film screening. When I ask him, what, where does your concept come from of promoting the film like that? And he's showing all kinds of films. He's showing documentary films, some old films with a 16 millimeter film. And what he told me, he said that in the Soviet cinematography this concept existed. When before screening of the movie you have a concert, you have a speech, and afterwards there were some documentary screenings, and afterwards there was a feature film shown. So perhaps those of us who work in the cinematography and promotion and distribution of the films we're not promoting this program that already existed, that Soviet cinema already used. So we were not taught that way. We don't um, perceive the documentary film in the um, in the movie theater. We only, you know, it's strange for us. So we have to educate people. We have to educate the audience to have a taste for documentary film and to have it screened that way. And I'm very thankful to you for doing what for doing your job. Thank you, really, huge thank you. We have somebody to learn from. It's you. 
And we as Russian people always learn something from Europe and this is an example. We really like your practice and we will be happy to take it in our screenings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that sounds great. So yeah, going back to some of the old traditions with taking a truck and driving cinemas out on the countryside, I think it's just, yeah, if you have the passion, just start doing it and, and think big. Yes, think big. So Doc Lounge Russia is next. Yeah. Coming up. <laughs> Any final comments or else I think we leave on that, end on that good note. Doc Lounge Russia, up next. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maya. That was Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you. I don't understand why there were only two cities from Denmark, Maya. There were only two cities from Denmark. Are we not cool and hip? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, we're just getting ready for the next speaker. <laughs>